I realized I have way too many cases. And so the focus became closing out as, you know, finishing out effectively as many cases as possible so that I could, you know, really give um, effective care to the cases I still have open. And then I realized I can't answer my own phone. <laughs> and I you know, was very, very strongly encouraged <laughs> to um, be like, no, you need to hire someone. You need to hire someone. And um, I ended up a former client also, um, we had uh, worked on her divorce. She, she was like, we ended up playing in the same pool league, and she was talking to me about how she needed a job. And I was like, yeah, I gotta hire an assistant. And she was like, I need a job. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so we talked about it. I was like, this is what we need. And she was like, she was like, well, you know, my experience is in sales. I this, was like, hey. <laughs> this is where, where you're talking about hiring former clients. This is where the the editor, the editor. <laughs> Flashes the picture up to Brenda. <laughs> One, two, three, go. There for Hardy RR. Believe it or not, welcome to the Lawyer Dana Show, the Lawyer Dana Podcast. Wow, we have a lot to talk about. And we're going to do it right after this. Welcome to the Lawyer Dana Podcast. So I'll, we'll start with an introduction. Uh, Denise Villarreal, and from the Villarreal Law Firm, or is it the Denise Villarreal? D. Y. Villarreal Law Firm. And it was a, it's a very common last name, so it was LawyerDenise.com. <laughs> and Lawyer Dana, Lawyer Denise, and Denise is one of the members of our coaching program. Who you you basically are starting from scratch uh, with a family law firm in Texas after moving from Florida. Tell us tell us some of your story. Um. Uh, okay, uh, graduated from the, yeah, you guys probably should have given me a swirly chair. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, was it, um, so I graduated from the University of Texas with a, an accounting degree and uh, went to work for a law firm. Um, I got the job um, kind of as a side gig. I was the um, filing clerk covering for the filing clerk that was going for uh, annual guard duty. And so I was just coming for covering for him for two weeks, and then they were gonna fire him. They they were, were gonna fire him before he went for guard leave, and then they were like, "Well, we can't fire him while he's going for guard leave." And so I didn't know any of that. But then he'd been back a couple of weeks, and they called me. They're like, "How do you? How, how would you feel about taking the job permanently?" And I was like, um, "Okay, I, I can do that part time." And uh, then their legal assistant, one of their legal assistants decided to go back to uh, grad school and they said, hey, hi, how do you feel about being a legal assistant? And I was like, um, okay, I can do that. And the first job I got was, we need you to draft um, uh, a notice of intent to sue under the Clean Water Act. And I was like, none of that made any sense to me. So I went and researched it and I wrote a letter and he was like, well, all I really needed was like the outline of uh, the shell of who we direct, address it to and all that. But, um, and apparently he made a couple of edits and then sent it off and I was, and that's kind of how it all started. And then- um, That's how I like to get them. Like, <laughs> wow, you did the whole letter for me? <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then I, I worked with them and uh, it was an administrative law firm in, in Austin and they pr focus almost exclusively on working with the TCEQ and the State Office of Administrative Hearings and, and dealing with environmental issues. Um, anyway, it was, it was really illuminating to kind of see how the office worked and how attorneys work. And I had actually been fighting the idea of being an attorney since high school. I had people my entire life going, oh, you'd be a great attorney. I was like, no, I'm gonna be an astronaut. Um, and then I was like, no, I'm gonna be a doctor. And, and then I, you know, I shadowed my dad and talked to my parents and they're like, you know, medicine's changing. and if you want to be an employee, then yes, be a doctor. But, um, and the only way to really change that is to be a lawyer and then uh, help regulate the medical profession. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do that, but lawyers are bad. And, and I was like, I can't do this. And, and so then of course I got these jobs right out of, out of undergrad. And I was like, well, maybe lawyers aren't bad. Maybe it's just my, you know, the lawyers that we've Not encountered. Only bad lawyers are bad. <laughs> and so uh, my mom was like, well, why don't you just take the LSAT? <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm not gonna take the LSAT, I'm not going to law school. Well, just, just take the LSAT and see how you do. So take the LSAT. And then um, I, uh, 
somewhere in there, I, I, I studied abroad in Scotland, met my, my uh, ex-husband, and um, then we got married. Was he Scottish? Yep. Okay. What? I thought I was making a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I, I married a, a Scotsman. and um, I, It's funny because it's true. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, I, and people always ask me, well, you never changed your name. I was like, well, I didn't change my name because we got married right after I had, um, right after I'd graduated from UT. And there was this possibility of either of going to medical school or law school. And I was like, my degree is in my maiden name. I don't want to mess everything up and have problems with applying in my married name. So the plan was apply, get accepted, graduate, then change my name. And so that my legal name would be my married name, but my professional name would match all my credentials. And uh, so, but then I got divorced in law school, so I never had to change my name. So that worked out. Wait, wait. You mean the process of going through law school? Did resulted that, in did, a divorce. Did that result in you having to get a divorce? Yeah. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I became a statistic. Um, but anyway, uh, so my what mom. A, a sad, sad, tragic <laughs> surprise. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so, I t so I took the LSAT and I actually did. I did pretty well, and my mom was like, well, just apply, just see who accepts you. And um, and at some point in my life, I'm gonna look back and I'll be like, I'm so grateful that my mother pushed me. Um, but part of it, I'm still like, I'm a lawyer because of my mother. <laughs> but- uh, You did this to me! <laughs> on the bad days, that's definitely how it feels. But um, I ended up getting accepted and offered a full scholarship to Ave Maria School of Law in Florida. Is that and where you went? That's where I ended Perfect. up going. And, um, if you're going to go to law school, go to the best school <laughs> that you can go to for free. For free. <laughs> yeah. if, there, if you have a choice of free schools, then pick the quote unquote best one, right? But like if one costs like $3 and another one is free, go to the free one. It's not worth the additional $3. Yeah. That, and that's kind of what I, I, I figured. But also, um, grew up in a Catholic family. My little sister and my older sister both went to Catholic school when they were really little. And uh, I was the only one that had escaped that fate, for better or worse. And I was like, you know what? I never went to Catholic school. I think I'd like to try it. And so it, uh, we made the cover of US News and World Report as the most devout law school. Um, we had a chaplain on, okay. on campus and daily mass. and. Um, but anyway, so I went through and I was like, after my experience with the law firm in Austin, I was like, I'm going to be an administrative lawyer. I really like what they do and they, it feels like more um, accessible to people and it feels like you don't really have bad lawyers in administrative law. And, um, and so I, I, I went... Did out for you? <laughs> no, no, it didn't. I actually had a, a professor get mad at me when I told him I wasn't planning on going into litigation or didn't want, really want to be in the courtroom. And he... Because he knew you or because like he just felt that way about those type of attorneys? No, well, so I, I did a, a, a trial advocacy in, in law school and, um, and I, I guess I did okay. Um, but then I did the um, trial, moot court trial competition and he was one of the judges and I managed to get the only directed verdict up to that time that they'd ever awarded during that competition. Wow. And... I mean, he had to rescind it immediately because we had to finish the competition, but um, but it was deserved and, and he said so and he was like, and he asked me, so what what kind of law are you intending to practice? I was like, I'm think, I'm really leaning towards administrative law and I really like the idea of working with administrative agencies because it's not something that people really are aware of, the fact that we've got this fourth branch of government, everybody has to interact with them. I feel like it's the most gonna be the most useful. And he was like, so you're not gonna practice in a courtroom? And it was like I was get, suddenly getting a lecture about how <laughs> you have this skill set. <laughs> how dare and you? Is putting your light under a bushel so, and just and just like yeah. he's like, if I talk to you in five years and you were and you have not been in a courtroom, um, it, 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 he was like, we're gonna have words. Essentially, is what it came down to. I was like, it's actually okay. a, a gift. It, well, that's, that's what I learned. Was not that's all the parable of the talents. Like you're burying your your talent. Don't. And 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 it was like we learned pretty pretty early on. As most people don't realize that majority of lawyers don't practice or don't practice in a courtroom or don't practice in private practice. They either go into industry or they have a job that's not working with clients or they're in-house counsel and um, a, a surprisingly small percentage actually see clients and go into court. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know that either. I thought everyone was Atticus Finch um, once I realized there were good lawyers. Prior to that, 
they were other lawyers in, in my head. Um, but yeah, so then I graduated from law school in Ave. Nobody was hiring in Southwest Florida. I, I took the bar, passed the bar. Was very proud of that pass because my school's bar pass rate at that time was like 50%. So I was very oh. proud of that pass. And uh, um, but anyway, uh, tried to get a job there in Southwest Florida. Nobody was hiring Ave grads. They were hiring, they would take us as interns for free labor or, wow. but they wouldn't hire wow. us after. Wow. And um, so a bunch of us just started hanging out our own shingle. One gentleman, uh, the, one of the gentlemen that did it a couple of years ahead of us, one of his first big cases was foreclosing on Bank of America. And so it cool. was, wow. yeah, it was pretty impressive. And, um, and so that kind of, I think, opened the door for a lot of us to say, you know, we can do this too. And um, up until then, Collier County in Southwest Florida had been a very, um, I guess, kind of a closed boutique law type community and all the lawyers kind of knew each other. It, at least it seemed that way. Um, and so when we come out and we're trying to get jobs and they're not hiring, and then we start our own practice and we're doing things the way we've been taught, not the way it's kind of expected to be practiced. Um, I mean, I got called avant-garde and I was like, well, here's a thought. If you don't like the rules I'm playing by, because they're the ones that are written down, maybe you should have hired us and taught us the way you, you think law should be practiced in Southwest Florida. But um, I ended up coming home. Uh, what were some of the things? Um, the fact that I filed a motion for rehearing and didn't tell opposing counsel that I was going to be doing it. Um, I, I don't know. There was nothing that required me to send him an email saying, I'm going to be filing a motion for rehearing on this, on this order. And did you, you had to give him a copy of it when you filed it, right? Mm -hmm. But they were mad that you didn't tell him. Well, it was just, it, it was, it was yeah. rude. And this was an avant-garde style of practice. And the thing is, it was, never, <laughs> it was never said to my face. I found that out later, but. Interesting. Um, well, I think it was because my, my client really wanted this. He really wanted uh, the argument to be made about this particular issue, even if it meant that he could be considered for contempt and jail time again. And so I don't think that's avant-garde. I think that it's risky, but my client understood the risks and was really pushing for it because he felt the judge made the wrong decision. And honestly, looking at the facts, I thought the judge did as well. But. I was like, the worst, the worst she can do is put you in jail. And he was like, I'm ready to go. And I was like, okay. are you sure? You know that. Can I videotape you saying, saying that? that? And can I get, get your signature right, right here? Notarize <laughs> that it's actually you. And right. Um, well, so anyway, um, I practiced. I ended up falling into construction law while I was there. I really enjoyed it. I worked with um, con contractors and subcontractors. Um, I did. Um, I did a four. I did two foreclosures. Um, so mostly property law. And then um, my parents, my grandparents started getting sick and my parents mm -hmm. both run their own business and uh, we're kind of feeling kind of the government regulation. My dad's a doctor, my mom's a pharmacist. And, uh, and so I was like, you know what, I'm not really doing them any good here. I could help better if I went home. Went home, didn't have a license yet. So I was doing accounting in Texas and then um, Decided just, I was like, oh, if, I, if I just hold out until the fifth year, if I just hold out to the fifth year while I keep my appliance in Texas, I can just wait in. And I just, I couldn't wait that long. So I ended up taking the bar and I kept looking at it. Like I'm halfway through studying for the bar. I'm like, what am I doing to myself? It was like a second <laughs> bar. Um, and so passed the, passed the Texas bar. And then about six months later, I was just like, I don't want to start all over again. I don't want to start like having to go find clients. I don't want to learn how to practice law in Texas. And, and understand all the nuances again on my own without any support or mentors. Um, and so I started looking for jobs and it was just very difficult to find anything in kind of the Austin area. Um, and so given that I had no experience in Texas and so I started, um, I started making cold calls looking for people that were doing pro bono work for veterans because that was an area of law. I was like, you know what, even no matter what else I do, I would love to give back to the veteran community. And so um, I ended up, uh, getting an appointment with an attorney and um, he ended up being a former judge who had started the veterans court program in Hayes County and what I thought was just a consult on how we can help each other serve veterans turned into a job interview ended up working for this law firm it was a strange setup I was I was a contract attorney but I was working under the name of the firm but I, I ran my own practice in that firm and it was 
but then all the money it was all handled by the main office. And so um, I was, I, that was when I start, first started taking family law cases. And so that was 2019. So I took my first family law case. Incidentally, I still have that case. Um, <laughs> the first case always takes forever. And for so, whatever reason, right? It's um, yeah. And then um, and it's not like it's not like it's it's just this weird coincidence that mm -hmm. people just tend to. I wonder if it's because you get that case that like then you get roped into family law. <laughs> Entirely possible. Um, <laughs> Well, anyway, Mr. Mr. Hall decided to retire and close that firm, and so some of us decided to go off on our, the other. The rest of the attorneys decided to go off on like as a group, um, but the other two attorneys were criminal law attorneys, and I was doing more civil litigation, and that just wasn't working. Like I was like, I need an assistant that can actually help me with discovery, because otherwise, I could do exactly one civil litigation case at a time. Because mm -hmm. if I do discovery, I can't do anything else. Um, Fair enough. And so. Uh, when um, I saw a post in the family law group about uh, soft divorce, the soft divorce program, I was like, well, if I'm going to continue doing any family law cases, I want that. That's how I think they should be handled. And so I want to know more about this program. And so I ended up going to the training that you offered in Dallas, October? Was it in October yeah. of last October, year? October, right? Yeah. November. October, November. I think November. it was October. Oh, it was November? Was it November? Brenda says it was. <laughs> okay, so that's <laughs> November. I never know. No. I that is always right. So yeah. Um, and everything that you were saying was stuff that I agreed with and I was on board with. And so um, uh, got got in the front door on that and realized that I couldn't stay where I was anymore. And um, and that was kind of hard to be able to be like, no, I don't wait until I start making money. I just I cut I cut that tie now. And, and, and get and go. And uh, I think that's my biggest problem is that paralysis of indecision. Paralysis or, by analysis. Yeah. And it's just like, no, 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 I, I need to get here or I need to get here before I can do that. And it's like, at the end of the day, remembering that it's never the perfect time to do anything. You just have to do it or, yeah. And so um, I went home or well, actually, we did a lot right there in the in the conference room. We I got the name registered with the Secretary of State. Um, we bought the the first set of website address names, um, and then uh, went home and finished it off. I got my EIN. I, I started opening my bank accounts. Um, I, I changed my my contact information with the state bar, um, and it was just kind of like everything. I mean, aside from a couple like snags with like. Chase Bank, you know, just trying to get, you know, accounts set up properly because I didn't fill out a form right or I didn't do something. Just getting all that set up, it was like, aside from that, everything just kind of fell into place. And then um, it just worked out that the uh, owner of the firm I'd gone into uh, also felt like it wasn't working. And so we ended up parting ways for formally on, June, on January 1st. And so I moved like within 48 hours, I had everything in my, the dining room of the house I'm living in and, and now it's my office. And, and it was just like everything fit in there perfectly <laughs> and it's great. And I mean, I switched my calendar. I got on Clio and I love Clio. And this isn't an endorsement or anything, but I love but case management. If you software. are gonna use Clio, we're gonna put that link because <laughs> I think we get 10 bucks or something. <laughs> so, yeah, you get 10 bucks. Help, but... help us fund the. <laughs> so if we get like 100 people that sign up, we still haven't paid for this episode of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but going from not having case management software to having case management software, I, I, it was un, an unbelievable transition. Even just that, just making that decision kind of changed uh, how, how I administer my practice. And then um, I realized I have way too many cases. And so the focus became closing out as, you know, finishing out effectively as many cases as possible so that I could, you know, really give um, effective care to the cases I still have open. And then I realized I can't answer my own phone. <laughs> and I you know, was very, very strongly encouraged <laughs> to um, be like, no, you need to hire someone. You need to hire someone. And um, I ended up a former client. Also, um, we had uh, worked on her divorce. She, she was like, we ended up playing in the same pool league. And she was talking to me about how she needed a job. And I was like, yeah, I got to hire an assistant. And she was like, 
I need a job. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so we talked about it. I was like, this is what we need. And she was like, she was like, well, you know, my experience is in sales. I this, was like, hey. This is where, where you're talking about hiring former clients. This is where the, the, the editor, the editor <laughs> flashes the picture up. The Brenda. <laughs> Brenda was a former client. I remember, at, yeah, I at remember At the time, the story, we, were, yeah. we were always joking, like, you would be the best paralegal we ever possibly could have. You're so organized and, like, just great. And then, all of a sudden, we hired her. Hey, Jennifer, can you summon Brenda? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Hey. Hey, guys. Did someone call? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Buttercup? <laughs> so now I, now I burned my story, because we told it on the break, what? of John Mullaney putting multiple, it's not on, uh, well, what's up, buttercups? It's his favorite what? meal that he's ever told. Was it what's up, was buddy, it? what's up, pussycat? What's up, pussycat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, what's up, what's up buttercup? buttercup? Yeah, what's up, pussycat? So, Apparently, uh, after 10 what's up, pussycats, uh, people lose their mind. <laughs> so if you, you should <laughs> try it we'll out. We'll put the link, it's hilarious. <laughs> So what were we going to talk to you about? Because actually it oh, wasn't quite so. Uh, yes. Former so client. hiring a former client. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, so that's how. So that's how we met. At, like the best part of my life. Yeah. Not. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part of me. Well, you know what? I. I it, it, it was good. It was good meeting Dana. Uh, when I did, I just met him a little too late. Seventeenth uh, attorney I interviewed to handle my divorce. Holy hell! Yeah, I didn't realize it was seventeen. Seventeen. And at the moment I heard that, I'm like, I'm not taking this case. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, like really, like I, I had just heard so much through other attorneys, like, you know, I wasn't wanting to take his retirement and my ex's retirement, and you know, I, I was trying to get through this like keeping my son's in mental health you know in mind that we would have to work together and so i didn't want to do anything that was going to you know turn that into a disaster and like dana said all the right things like really he was great his soft divorce philosophy but i was just so afraid at that point that i didn't end up hiring him at that time but no, you hired the bulldog. I hired, <laughs> I hired the hammer. Yeah, not the Texas hammer. I was just saying, Jim Butler. Not, not <laughs> the, <laughs> I didn't know he did the we, we gotta make that clear. That's probably copyrighted. Not the hammer. The bulldog. We'll go with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a, a bulldog, a yeah. bulldog type. Yeah, yeah. And, but I, and I know that guy actually, and he's 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 an okay attorney. I mean, he, he's fine for an attorney. Um, but it's, it's the approach. It's the approach. Mm -hmm. And he's a nice person. I like him as a, like, I like him personally. I like a lot of those attorneys personally, like on a personal level. I just fundamentally disagree with the approach. The approach. And it's not, it's not even necessarily like their fault. I mean, that's how a lot of people think you're supposed to do it. And it's the cliche. And I'm like, it's, you know, you're living in, you're living in the past, man. Like, it's not. And the judges see right through it. It's really impressive to the clients. And, mm -hmm. and maybe in front of a jury, maybe you can convince a jury with that stuff, maybe, but usually not. But how often does a family law case go to a jury Hardly trial? Hardly ever. And it should, this is the S word, right? There's the S word should and the, the F, F word S. fair. I, I, I realize that the F word that you really should focus on is fine. It's fine. Can you do that? Or would it, like, it's fine. If you can get to it, it's fine. It's fine is fine is it's fine because it's in the margin of error. There's always a margin of error with this mm -hmm. stuff. And if you're gonna settle, like if you if you have to have everything absolutely maximized and you're willing to compromise nothing, like sorry for the terrible life you're going to live. Because if all I have to do is open your eyes to everything else you're sacrificing. Like if you're if you focus on the money, you better put a dollar amount on how much is it worth that your kids don't hate you for the way that you treated their other parent. And like, oh, you think that's a win? Well, there's, so there's going to be abundance at your place, at, at your house when the kids are there, and there's going to be lack at their other parents' house. You think they're not going to judge you both for that? How come you didn't? Uh, how come you let our other parent take advantage of you? How come you took advantage of my other parent? Really? And and 
you think the jury, the 12 people that are sitting in that box over there during your trial, you think that's who you're really for? And by the way, yeah, a, a jury trials used to exist in the 90s, and it, most kids never got to read the transcript because that's all that there is. Now, the internet that. exists. It's always going to be there, and not just them, all of their friends, the moment that they think it, within 20 seconds, will have it in their hand, magically. Like this magical, this ma where's my device? I'm losing my phone. Like, if only there was something in the in that some device that you could magically have all the answers to every question that you could ever think of and magically have like God's omniscient point of view, at least if there was a camera in the room, it's here and you can summon it within 10 seconds like it's magic. That exists. So you think that the jury is the 12 people in the box? Really, how old are your kids? Five? Yeah, well, they're not going to understand that now. No, but uh, next week when they're, uh, or when they're eight years old, and their friend has, is the first one that has a phone as an eight-year-old. Oh, wait, no. Uh, kids actually have phones at five and four and three and seven, like, and they have them at elementary school, and they're going to pull up this stuff and show it to your kid. They That's where you want them to see this. And mm -hmm. by the way, they're not going to necessarily watch the whole trial. They're just going to watch this horrible little excerpt. Like, you know, that one little snippet when we're sitting there through your deposition that you weren't afraid of, but guess what? In that thing that just went right by you through that deposition three days later, or you come back later or whatever, or you're finally at the trial and the, the me, if you force me to go to trial, I'm going to freaking crush you because you've made me do it. I offered you outs over and over and over again. But if we're in trial, like I'm going to take that snippet and that's going to be there. And guess what? Your kids friends are going to present them at elementary school or junior high or high school or college or in their 20s. Your jury is not the 12 people in the box, you fool. Your jury is your children and even more important, your own subconscious, you idiot. You're the one that has to live with this. And despite your, your self-righteous bravado, you're a fool and you're going to regret this. And not only are you going to keep the harm that you're going to suffer while going through it, you're going to make a permanent scar inside of your mind, your heart, your spirit, and your soul in having to go through all of this crap. And it's going to be something you can't recover from. And your story about yourself is going to be so warped that you're going to be forever damaged by it. Either that, or you can, out of wisdom, craft your story right now to rectify this situation and take the generous gift that the Palmer Law Group, with their brand of soft divorce and healthy divorce, is offering you a way out of this and that we don't have to ruin the present with the things that have happened in the past and you don't have to ruin your future with things that have happened in your past or any of that stuff because the real gift and what we really do here is end the fighting not increase it. Let's put it all behind us. So the philosophy makes a difference. I think that um, on some level, like some of the people I went to law school with were shying away from courtroom practice because they just didn't want to fight with people just to fight with people. And I feel like the profession loses out on that because you lose some really good lawyers um, who could help develop really good case law you know, through the process that just don't want to deal with the nonsense. It's like my little sister is currently running for mayor for a small town here in Texas, and um, her husband is her campaign manager. And he always says that politics would, politics would be great if it weren't for the politics. It's like, <laughs> I feel like in some, in some ways it's the same thing with law. It's like practicing law would be great if it weren't for some lawyers. And, and it's unfortunate. Trial, trial practice is actually about giving a good and clear presentation to the judge and keeping track of the big picture. Really, a, a, a trial is all about the preparation. It's, I mean, you know whether or not you're going to win that case based on what, how well and what you've prepared ahead of time. It's if you've done it properly, assuming that there's the budget. I mean, the, the real one of the real problems with going to trial is like massively expensive. Uh, in Depp versus Heard, they're spending millions of dollars, both of them. Uh, and Amber Heard was supposedly getting these like $100,000 a month payouts to seven million or something, and something along those lines. We're, I'm not sure exactly what the exact specifics of it are. And she was pledged to donate that to some charities. And then when the suit happened, she stopped making the donation. 
I'm like, yeah, because this, ca this case, I assure you, is costing her probably $100,000 a month. Uh, I'm looking at it and seeing the preparation, and I know the levels of what is a $5,000 a month case, what is a 20, what is a 35, 40,000, what's a 50, what's a $100,000 a month type of case, and then the level of preparation. And when you're seeing, they're doing a lot of depositions, there's video depositions, and it's the, how much did it cost to take those depositions? And at a deposition, you're, pay, you're paying your, your attorney, you're paying, you, and you're paying an attorney and a paralegal to be at every deposition at a minimum. Um, and possibly multiple attorneys, just depending on who the deponent is. And then you have a videographer and a court reporter. It's not uncommon for a deposition to cost your side, if you're the one taking the deposition, for it to cost $15,000, maybe 20, yeah. uh, depending on what the preparation is. And they're, they're having person after person after person after person. In addition, by the, at this trial, they have viewed those depositions, they have edited and pulled out the parts and things that they want out of those depositions. Yeah. That's at least doubles the price again. So you're at like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And if they're doing with the number of depositions, if they had a half a million dollars on Johnny Depp's side just in dealing with depositions and preparing that evidence for trial, to me, I'm like, that's, I see where that money is spent. I understand that and I understand that level of preparation. And if you're really going to do something like that, I, I think the interesting thing about the Depp versus Heard trial is um, it's, om it's probably a necessary trial because if Johnny Depp's allegation is true, and Amber Heard has done what she has done, then she just simply cannot retract that. It's too, it's too public and it's all, it, the whole case is about reputation. And maybe the jury can come back. Uh, the, there's a big weakness in Johnny Depp's case is because there's, he's suing her over defamation after the divorce was done. And the only reason that anything about the divorce or what or the truth is, is because it's a defamation claim. And the defamation happened after the divorce was done. Otherwise, this would be in the in context the of the divorce itself. Hmm. And the he, she further defamed him again, at least that's the allegation, but didn't mention him by name. It said, I'm the face of being a victim of, of uh, yeah, I think domestic it, abuse. If I remember correctly, there, there is case law to show that it has to be like if she wants to get away with that, it has to be that she's been in multiple relationships and it has to be very clear that it's, you, like it, it can't be very clear that it's him that she's referring to. Well, yeah. could it be, could they be doing that? Um, like her side be trying to prove that by he, she was with Elon and someone else. It's not Elon, it's her father. They're, they're, the angle that they're actually going off of at least, and I've watched the first uh, three days of the trial and I've watched the first day, or no, I've watched for two days, full days and a half of the third actual day of trial with the other witnesses. And then Johnny Depp came in in the second week and I've watched his full first day and about an hour and a half of his testimony after that. By the end of this week, and today's Friday, this is the end of, as we're filming this, it's the end of the second week. And I will, by probably Sunday night, catch up. I'm watching it at double speed and I get to fast forward through the 15 minute breaks here and the lunch break and things like that. The recordings are about seven to eight hour long recordings, like I'm watching Sky News as feed. We will probably do select excerpts and comment, like comment on the actual trial. And we'll either do that probably as I'm caught up to, to where we need to be, um, just dep depending on the timing. But right now I'm basically rushing through it in any free time, like I'm listening to it in the shower or like while I'm uh, at different times of the other day, just trying to catch up. But anyway, um, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, clearly it's a court of public opinion case. And, the, but, and people are gonna put too much um, stock in whatever the jury comes back at. Especially if the jury comes back on, it was, we wanted to give it to this, or especially if it's, if it's against Johnny. I, the, it's gonna be that, well, we wanted to give it to Johnny, but because of, it's not purely defamation, but yeah, she, I mean, she did Johnny wrong, and something like that, but people are going to think uh, the court of public opinion is not going to see it for the elements of the offense, which is always the risk of a jury in any trial, is, is that in a court of public opinion case, it, the jury is the public, right? And that public is certainly not going to say, well, it's all about defamation and this and that. They're going to think, oh, 
Johnny was right and Amber was wrong, or Amber was right and Johnny was wrong, it depends on who comes out. It's like they're going to declare one of them is a winner and one of them is a loser, and they're going to think that the, the winner is now absolved and gets the Hollywood career and the loser doesn't. And it, it judged based on that, that's actually not what the verdict is, is actually is. The verdict actually is something different. But people are going to look at it like a football score of like more points, you yes or no, like that means you're right and you win. And they're going to extrapolate and interpolate all of these wrong conclusions out of it. I feel like this might be the kind of first big profile case in a while where that's the case because I feel like... I think it's the biggest case since Simpson. Well, I feel like the, um, the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Uh, Rittenhouse, yeah, well, but I think... I feel like... I think it's bigger than Rittenhouse because well, Rittenhouse was famous from the case and because of the case and it was a big element. But these two are famous. And Johnny Dame, Johnny Depp, especially since Pirates, there's a lot of testimony of like, hey, how did your life change after the first Pirates movie? And he was like, oh, it was, he, like, I can't even go out in public anymore. And it, it, he, he goes, I, it, I hide and stay in the hotels and have to go in the back ways and like, because any, anything, it, it turns into something else. Yeah. And it was all because of that first Pirates movie. It right. was like, he was, he was, he was like regular, famous, and there was some of that, but he could go out in public until that first Pirates movie, and then it was. So I guess what I, what I was saying was not so much that this is a, the, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial was bigger. My point was more along the lines of the public had their mind made up. Like if, if you were watching anything, I'd say a very small percentage of the public actually's mind was changed by the jury verdict in Kyle Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse I feel like a majority of people either believe that he hadn't done anything wrong because they waited for more information or you had people that were like, no, he was wrong, he's guilty, and the jury's wrong. Um, like with the um, with some of the other kind of high profile cases that have come out, you have a lot of people that just don't, they're like, the jury is wrong. If the jury comes back with the wrong verdict, then there's going to be riots. Like, um, I can't remember, I don't think it was the, I don't think it was the police officers in George Floyd. I think it was one of the other cases where they came out um, and the, the, the oh, no, defendant. George, George Floyd, Floyd was a huge. created a lot of riots. Right. I'm talking, I was actually going to say there was another one where they were expecting, maybe it was Rittenhouse, where they were expecting riots because the defendant the, was, the someone right. was, was um, yeah. uh, acquitted and there wasn't, yeah. uh, but they were prepared for him. Right. Um, but there were still people, plenty of people speaking out about how that, you know, that the jury came to the wrong verdict. And I feel like with this one, there are a lot of more, a lot more people that just want to know what happened. Right. And, it, and I so, so I feel like there will be more, like you said, there I think will the, be more. The jury is out much more in this case than ever. And I think even in OJ, because I remember OJ well, I was in high school at the time. Oh, me too. And, uh, I don't which by the way, that also invokes Norm MacDonald because he, he just constantly. When, when that, I remember when the verdict for OJ came out, it was like, I was in high school and kids were like going through the hall, juice is loose, juice is loose. Like I it was, that part. oh, in my high school, <laughs> that's loose. what was going on. <laughs> It was insane. All I remember yeah. was, uh, are you, it was were you it, fifth grade? God, it must fifth, have been. Yeah, I, mean, I, I remember the jokes like if it I, doesn't fit, you have to. Quit. <laughs> yes. I remember yes. that. That's Johnny Cochran, right? Oh, yeah. I remember the rhyme. And Norm McDonald actually told a good story of this. I'll tell Norm's version because I didn't see the actual yeah. jury. He goes, they spent two weeks on blood evidence, and there was a there was one of the jurors who was interviewed afterwards, and they go, so uh, you know, but what about all that blood evidence? And the juror goes. Everybody got blood. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. But you know, you're. <laughs> hey. And it goes, and, and, but she remembered the rhyme. If, if, the, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. So we acquitted. Oh, yeah. Right? I assure you, I can take a glove off of my hand, and then Maybe that glove won't fit. fit. Mm -hmm. Right? How yeah. hard is that? Like, well, I just started golfing, and I'm terrible, by the way, terrible. Uh, but I got a, I got a golf club, and you know I that, swear it takes forever. You know, it takes yeah. some effort yeah. to get that on. You know that uh, you, uh, O.J. Simpson actually plays a lot of golf, and so the, so when you're so on the all golf, all golfers are murderers. When you're on no, <laughs> no when, just, when, you're on, just when you're on the golf course, you have to drink apple juice because O.J. will kill you. <laughs> Okay, that was clever. <laughs> when I uh, when I was working at the Crescent, uh, he came into the courtyard, and we had this really high end like uh, store. I'm not going to name their name, a very high end like boutique. 
like special, like they fitted everything. Jerry Jones's family was shopped there, kind of thing. Extremely expensive. You know, I'm talking like five hundred thousand dollars for this pair of socks, kind of stuff. And, what? Yeah. Oh yeah. So anyway, he made of diamonds. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Anyway, he came into my restaurant and into the bar area, and this is the first time I ever seen anything like this. But the owner of that store came into because he acted like he owned our restaurant. He was just like that. He comes prancing into the restaurant and looked at him straight in the face, like you are not welcome in there. You're not welcome in this area. You need to leave. Go. No one wants you here. What? And I was Why? like, it was after. Oh, it was it was it was years after the civil trial too probably it was in the 2000s oh because i started working there in 2003 so this was probably like 2006 7 and i had never seen anything like it he told him you need to get out of here you're not welcome did he leave he did okay i think that it was right before you know all the stuff went down in vegas with him. Oh, wow, yeah. You know. Crazy. Yeah. That was in fifth grade. And then Selena yeah. died. So Yeah, and I Selena remember Selena. Over. Yeah, Selena. That's where we were. Corpus. I was a freshman in high school. Girl. I was. <laughs> when Selena died. Because I was in Corpus Christi. I lived in Corpus Christi. And oh, so okay. we got put on lockdown. Any of y'all remember the Rodney King riots, too, after that case? I think that's like the. I'm probably the oldest out of us, right? Yeah. Rodney King was early 90s, er, er, late like, 80s, early 90s. Late 80s, maybe. I was out of the country. 90s. Mm-hmm. And it was the first that I'd ever heard about something like that. But I, I mean, obviously, like there was stuff going on in the '60s and all that. Kent State and all that. Before, like Kent State was before my time. But yeah. Rodney King, like I was a kid, but had heard about it. I remember the riots, and I remember like I read watching about videos it. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then OJ was like the first where I was like, I think I was. I I I, I remember it, it was going on like during my 11th grade year, or so. I must have been about 16. I mean, the, the things that I remember as a kid is the David Koresh. Oh, I remember that too. Like, that was, yep. like, on TV yep. for days. Yeah, we're in Texas, so you guys Hey, know Federals, uh, you might want to just have some patience and wait it out instead of, I don't know, causing the death of... The entire compound? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, maybe, I, maybe my, wait it my out. middle school... It's not like you guys didn't have, like, I don't know, supplies and then everything else. Like, how long could they have waited? If you're there a year, be there a year, whatever. So my middle school was, uh, I want to say five miles, five, ten miles from the hotel where Selena was shot. Oh. And so when all... Oh, what? Yeah. yeah, she was shot by her manager. manager. Believe it or not. Who was I'm, stealing oh, I from that. her. Believe it or not, her, yeah. I, as a, as a young um, classical music and uh, rock metal uh, enthusiast, was not very familiar with Selena's. I didn't know who she was until after the movie came out. Oh yeah. Um, I did, too. however, know that she had been shot, and I was like, "Oh, a Toronto musician named Selena was killed, and she's from Corpus because it was in the paper, and it was a very, very big deal." Mm-hmm. But our the middle school was put on lockdown oh, wow. because of the active shooter situation. How because far was it from you? It's like five miles away. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. No, we also got put on lockdown for chemical when the when the refineries would have an accident because we were. Five miles away from that too. Um, but yeah, so, so move to Corpus. <laughs> why That's what I'm saying. Why would they put you on? Get the hell out of there! <laughs> hey, let's lock them in the school. Well, hey, put this mask of poison on. They're, they're, they're gonna turn them all into Spider-Man. No. Spider-Man. No, yeah, no, that was kind of like a really big deal. And then, like, I mean, she had a huge funeral procession. I know and that. Yeah. She's actually buried. I so she was like well, well loved. Oh yeah, yeah. And, her, um, the movie's was, great about her. I've seen story. some interviews of her in like recent weeks. Is that but, no, Selena. It's Selena. J Lo. Wow. Great wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's actually. I'm buried. just trying to keep track the camera guys up. <laughs> I'm good. She was actually. She's buried like right around the corner from my sister. They're in the same cemetery, and um, initially it was just a, this really tasteful headstone that. Uh, well, they give you the temporary one that had Selena Quintanilla Perez, and then I think there was a headstone initially that had her full legal name on it with the, the de- birth and death years. But then um, I don't know. We were visiting Monica, and we went by because you drive. We drove the outer ring to get out, and they had changed the headstone, and now it had her signature, like her her logo, okay. instead of her like legal name. And then we went by maybe a year or two later, and there's this now 
huge bronze like impression of her face on top of her grave which is and it's like roped off and stuff and it was just like mm -hmm. that, I like the first one better mm -hmm. but they've also got a statue of her down on the shore on shoreline giant pyramid with a picture of the, with the sphinx with her face on. there's a statue of her downtown uh, uh, and uh, every year that we have every year we have hurricanes or major storms somebody goes and puts a life jacket on the statue oh wow <laughs> it's really kind of cool <laughs> well, where was christy well dana i know you uh have some exciting things coming up for you you're Ooh. starting healthymarriage.com yeah um but so I, you, you, you want to do our first podcast with healthymarriage.com Sure, I'm not right. married. And we're going to do it right after this, and we'll see you in episode 11. That's going to wrap 10, right? 10, yes. Okay. And uh, like, subscribe. Smash that like button. Smash yes. It. Smash it. Smash. Hit the little bell. Right? Smash. The little yeah. bell to subscribe. Hit the little bell with, with your alerts. Notifications. Notifications, yeah. and uh, like, sign up at lawyerdana.com. Give us your email address so that we can keep in touch with you for forever. <laughs> Will, uh, notify you of in-person appearances and, and go to worthyvision.com so you can learn all about coaching techniques and if you want to coach like denise uh, worthyvision.com or be coached like denise be coached like denise. actually depending on how like maybe a few years from now you might be one of our instructors hey that'd be fun we like people that are successful and we will see you done a lot of things wrong along the way so maybe it will be very helpful but less than you would. Oh, this is what I meant before I met you. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we will then uh, see you in the next episode. The Lawyer Dana Podcast.